Hello again, I'm Braddock Supervisor John Cook. Welcome back to Braddock Neighborhood News, the program I am using to provide you with information on issues facing our community and ideas on how we can strengthen our neighborhoods. This month, I'm pleased to have our Braddock District Lord and Lady Fairfax honorees, Rich Chabot and Donna Goldbranson. Every year, each member of the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors selects two individuals who have demonstrated outstanding volunteer service, heroism, or other special accomplishments to receive the award. Our recipients this year exemplify these qualities, and I appreciate their taking time out of their busy day to sit down and talk. Rich, Donna, thanks so much for being on the show. And uh, let me thank you, too, for the community, for all the work that you've done. Uh, the Lord and Lady Fairfax uh, uh, honorary program, you know, it's part of Celebrate Fairfax, our, our annual county fair. And it, it's really an honor for our board to be able to every year, you know, pick a couple people who have had just a career of community service like yourselves and to, you know, hold you up and say thanks and inspire others to do the same. So thank you very much. Rich, let's talk about some of the things you've done for the county. You know, recently uh, as chairman of our commission on uh, 50 plus commission, you've been very involved in our 50 plus plan, but you've done a whole lot of other stuff too, including running the neighborhood right across the street from me. Right. Well, <laughs> first of all, just a comment. First of all, thank you, um, I think, on both behalf of Donna and myself for the recognition because we really appreciate it. Yes. But we also recognize that it's not only us, it's all of the people who work with us who are just as deserving as we are of the honor. So it's nice to be recognized, but it's also a lot of people out there that are making the recognition possible. As to what I do as a volunteer, well, as you say, my wife and I are respectively president and secretary of our civic association. We've been doing that for a couple of years. This is Red Fox Forest. And I do currently chair the Fairfax County Area Commission on Aging and also serve as a um, member of the board of something called the Consolidated Community Funding Advisory Pool. Um, the last thing we do is we, um, again, Mary and I are co-chairs of a transportation ministry at our parish, Holy Spirit, where we transport people who need rides to medical appointments, which we find is one of the real needs in Fairfax County to get older adults to medical appointments, particularly when they can't drive. Um, in terms of what that entails, as you mentioned, um, the Commission's primary focus right now is on what they call the 50-plus Community Action Plan, which was accepted and um, sort of promulgated by the Board of Supervisors in September of 2014. And what we're doing there is we're basically working on 31 separate initiatives that are designed to be implemented over the next one to three years in various areas. Um, for example, um, recently many of you have probably heard about or participated in the um, creativity um, issue, the um, creative aging month of May, where there were a lot of activities throughout the county and a lot of organizations were supporting those. Um, the consolidated community funding pool is something that's been in existence since the early 80s and provides in this current fiscal year roughly $12 million for human services related projects. This, these are awarded or have been awarded in the past to approximately 100, over 100 nonprofit organizations, and they basically serve to leverage and supplement um, programs that exist within the county bureaucracy, per se. Um, so a lot of things are going on, a lot of exciting things, a lot of things that really excite me. And as I say, it's a pleasure for me to be involved in those things. And Richard, I appreciate that. We're going to come back and talk about the 50-plus plan because there's so much there to talk about. Donna, you've uh, really devoted a, a large part of your life to SPARC, your organization, yes. and you're doing great work. And tell us, first of all, what the acronym stands yeah. for and then the stuff that you do. Right. Well, it is, uh, as Rich <coughs> said, it's a wonderful pleasure to be here, and, and thank you. And all the people, um, all the families, it, SPARC is a grassroots <coughs> organization, so there are many people to thank. SPARC stands for Specially Adapted Resource Clubs. And this is an answer to the question, what does my adult child do? Um, when I graduate from high school with uh, multiple disabilities. And so about 10 years ago, the Board of Supervisors did ask the question, hey, um, we have a lot of parents and a lot of self-advocates coming to us saying they're aging out of everything. They're aging out of school, they're 22, and what do they do? And so we did a really thorough scan in the community and saw the gap in services was daytime activities, people who are falling through the traditional human services system. So Spark is definitely a niche provider, but it, 
it has the potential to expand and serve many more people as the demand really does increase and we're seeing in our schools, particularly with friends on the spectrum. And um, I just want to say thank you to Rich, particularly for the work that he does with the CCFAC, the Consolidated Funding Pool Advisory Council, because that is um, one of the very critical funding sources that uh, started Spark many years ago. So we are eight years old, and we wouldn't be here without the collaborative efforts and the champions that we have in Fairfax County. Right, and Donna, the, um, you you've really hit on a point that, that your work, and and not just with Spark, but you know, as you advocate and work with others in the county that we do have a lot of programs for children and right. working through our schools and talk a little bit about what it means uh, to a parent when your child becomes 18 and or 21 depending right. Right. and the uh, uh, the services provided in school end what happens? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great challenge and, and, it's, and it's quite a labyrinth to navigate as families and and you know, not, not to be you know too too comical, but it's almost to hi, Mrs. Goldbranson. It's a baby girl because all of a sudden, mandated services stop. You you are a, you know a parent of a young adult child at the age of 22, 18 to 22, as you say, because we have some friends on the spectrum who are graduating with regular degrees, but they're not ready for vocation or to navigate the community. So we see a real gap in services, and and a lot of it comes down to funding, and you know that well. Um, what Medicaid funding there is, there are great lengthy waiting lists, and is everything that we currently have um, in our toolbox appropriate for everybody coming out of the system? So um, I really think that as we look at what we, the message we want to give parents, um, don't be scared, um, but it is, it is our job to help you navigate and understand the resources that we currently have and where your adult child will fit the best because we do have some tremendous things in the county we are cr trying to create the things that we don't have at spark to try and, and fill the gap um, but thinking early is really the plan um, you know thinking early is really important we want parents to be looking in middle school hey you know what i better figure out what are we going to be doing at 22 because that's um, i think parents are looking at all the advocates they advocacy they do in school where there's a system, but they're not really prepared for mandated services stopping at 22. And conceptually, um, you, know, you get up to the 64,000 foot level, and, and, and Rich, you've worked uh, this, this concept on the 50 plus plan, that, that um, we have a whole population of people, and it may be people who are aging, it may be people with disabilities, others, and we say, you know, we're talking about quality of life and the ability to when we say, you know, we talk about access, it's not just accessing a transportation network or something, it's accessing the enjoyment of life. And Rich, that's part of, you know, at a conceptual level, what the 50 plus plan was about is having the ability to continue to enjoy life, you know, well, well into your older years. Well, I mean, that's part of it because there are some initiatives that relate to that. But there are certain things that obviously are realities for Fairfax County. Number one is the demographics particularly the growth of the 60 plus and the 85 plus population. Number two is the fact that the county cannot afford to be all things to all people. So the 50 plus pro program focuses on things that are actionable, attainable, and affordable. And we're really looking either to leverage relationships or to find programs that can be self-sustaining outside of the county revenue stream. So part of the things are truly enjoyment, like Creative Arts Festival. I mean, it is amazing to me when I read the literature on the effect that participation in the arts can have on a person relative to cognitive health. Um, <coughs> so there is that. But there are also things like, for example, I'm involved directly in an initiative called Caring for Caregivers. We know that the number of caregivers required are going to increase. We know that people who care for people at home either with cognitive problems or with medical problems are themselves isolated and in many cases have difficulties through stress, so we're trying to help them to organize themselves to provide, even though the county does already provide, to provide ways that they can function more effectively and can really get respite at times from care. There's a whole gamut of things. We're talking about emergency response. We're talking about house sharing for people who don't have the ability to live in their own homes economically. Um, just a gamut of things are happening. As I say, enjoyment is one thing, but human service is really what it's all about and making the quality of life for people who are aging and also for the rest of the community. 
a much more livable place. And Rich, you know, you, you mentioned caregivers, and Donna, I wanted to yeah. get over to you on that because that's something you know a lot about. <laughs> a lot. And tell us a about uh, the importance of caregivers, one, accessing, you know, the help they need for the people they're caring for, but that concept of respite, it's not just when you're older, but it's when you're the parent of one of the children that you work with. Right, and there are a couple of, a couple of key um, resources that I think families need to know about. Um, one is the collaborative work um, that I know the commission um, that Rich uh, chairs works with the Long-Term Care Coordinating Council. You know, we're, we're constantly communicating and trying to understand what programs and what resources are in the county so that we're all sharing the right things with each other. Um, there is a subcommittee um, on the Long-Term Care Coordinating Council for young adult services and that's a very important um, resource for people. And caregivers is going to be one of the hot issues along with housing. As we age in this county with disabilities, I mean we're sitting here talking about long-term care and the long-term care for children with disabilities is the span of their whole life and then what does that do for families who are who are aging as well. So caregiver um, care is, is a really big issue. How do I continue caring for my adult child when they're 30, 40, 50? At what point in time am I looking to transition yeah. them per perhaps right. to care outside of the home? How do I get some respite? How do I get yes. some help in my home as that caregiver? Family caregivers are asked to do an enormous amount of the heavy lifting without pay. Then there's professional caregivers and how do I afford that? How am I, how am I putting support services around my adult child? So the other thing that's very unique about Fairfax County that I'd like to really give a shout out to is, is uh, at the Community Services Board is the self-directed services money. As you're sitting on waiver wait lists and you're waiting for this, this, this list um, that is seemingly endless as your adult child is on that list, there is um, a way if you are qualified for intellectual disability services to have money from Fairfax County to put non-Medicaid supports around your adult child as they graduate. That in fact has actually been a tremendous help to some of our families at SPARC and it's how they are paying for SPARC as we're a non-Medicaid program. So there are, there are important people um, at the Community Services Board, transition specialists in the high school, long-term care coordinating council, um, SPARC, the Arc of Northern Virginia. You know, SPARC it really exists through partnership. We really have a, a great network of nonprofits in our area doing doing different things and we can really help connect you to services so that's one thing I want to let everybody know All right rich you know Donna was talking about uh, a caregiver a parent of an now adult child your com your committees have worked a lot with spouses as a caregiver and of course as we age we don't always know whether we're going to be the caregiver or the caregivee or both but that's something that we all need to sort of be thinking about as we age, but also, you know, my generation, sandwich generation, yes. right? I mean, we, and I know in our house, when my mother-in-law moved in with us, and we had <laughs> one-year-old twins, and we had a, uh, you know, a 79-year-old who we quickly learned needed a lot more help than we thought, and you've looked at some of those issues. Well, I was reading an article recently, and they, they used the term elder orphans, and they were talking about within the boomer community, as they age, many have not married, many do not have children, or have children who are in remote locations. And particularly if one spouse passes away, you have an individual who really does not have a caregiving network. And that's going to increase. I mean, the numbers are rather alarming. And AARP just came out with a report. It's similar to the Social Security workers to recipient ratios. <coughs> they were talking about basically <coughs> ratios of caregivers to needed recipients. And the ratio could drop in the next 20 years from like what it's now one to seven to like one to four or even one to two in the 40s and 50s. So the fact of the matter is, I mean, we have demographics that's pressing on us. The, the other thing is the fact that when you look at the increased incidence of cognitive impairment, uh, dementia type diseases, particularly Alzheimer's, we know they're going to increase. I mean, they haven't come with the magic bullet yet. So this whole concept of caregiving is going to be something that is going to impinge on the county and on the nation. Um, in ways that are going to be, I think, both costly, but also from a human services and a human need point of view, going to have requirements for s specific services and attention. Right. Um, and let, let's, you know, we, we've we've gotten real. We, we've we've gotten into the real serious part, and and we'll come back to that. But I wanted to also make sure we talk about, you know, the good news. Uh, that we have in in the joy that we're bringing or you know to people's lives and we touched on it, rich you talked about the the creative aspects yeah. of the 50 plus plan and how 
uh, it, you know, it's true that the arts, they found the, the, what it does to your cognitive abilities, it wakens you up the whole nine yards. And Donna, I know that's a lot about yes. what you're seeking right. to do is yeah. that quality of life part. Absolutely, absolutely, because we want families to understand that that this is the next chapter after high school. And I always say when that yellow school bus stops coming, you know, what's it yeah. like? And it's, it's, it's kind of scary, but I'm here to tell you, it's, it's wonderful. And our daughter, Kristen, is 24. She graduated from the Key Center um, in 2013, and she's thriving, as are 26 other young adults in our program. And there are, there are ways to help families. And what we, what we do find is that our families are the best caregivers. They, they know what, what they are doing. Um, these young adults are not quite ready to live on their own. And so let's just put a little bit around these families and, and, and a happy life can be had by all. So I do wanna say that it's, it's about coordination of care, coordination of services, sharing resources and not putting a burden on any one place. And they are out in the community at Spark doing more than I can tell you. And the arts is a big part of it. We had a wonderful art show last year at uh, Northern Virginia Community College and the Verizon Center there. Um, it, it's fabulous. We're, we're, we're going and shaking and doing and exploring and experiencing things like never before. We're heading down to the National Gallery of Art tomorrow, so watch out, Silver Line. We're going on it. <laughs> yeah. And, and Rich, you, know, you talked about the elder orphans, but part of the 50 plus plan is to develop that sense of, of a community where people can look at out for each other, well, it's, whether it's a village right. concept or otherwise. And let's talk a little bit about how we help bring that you know positive family experience we just heard Donna talk about to the elder orphans well, and others. Well, one of the reason, one of the things that you're going to hear a term that if if anybody hasn't heard it, I'd be very surprised is aging in place, mm -hmm. and the idea that people really a preponderance of people want to age in their own homes, as opposed to cycling through to some type of an institutional setting. Also, there's an economic benefit, obviously, to aging in place. But the consequence of that is the fact that we have small communities and neighborhoods, like Red Fox Forest, we have 198 homes. We still have about 12 people that are original owners. They go back to the 1964. So these people, as they age in place, are going to need supports. The other reality, unfortunately, is the fact that what was the norm when Red Fox Forest was founded in 1963, which is a lot of community activities, and a homogeneous population. There's a lot of heterogeneity now, and people are so busy with the demands of daily living that in many cases, we lose sight of the needs of our neighbors. So one of the things we have to continually work on and promote is the idea of how do we get people to be aware of not only themselves and their immediate neighbors, but also the needs of the community in general. I haven't solved that problem yet, and I suspect if I do, I'll be able to retire a wealthy man. <laughs> but, but we have. But let's let's talk about uh, a little bit about this. You know, village concept is one of many that your committee has looked at, and that is a way to take people who are maybe alone in their homes, who would be isolated in their homes, and connecting them with neighbors. And that is true. The village concept, which is something which began in Boston, and which has its best exemplification in this area in, on Capitol Hill. Yes, it's been very useful as a woman named Patricia Rohr in the health department who's doing a great deal to promote that concept, and I think there are now 11 or 12 active villages. It's a great idea, and it does exactly what you say it does. It promotes basically community. However, the downside is for some villages there's a, there's a, um, a fee, um, and I've been told by a number of people who run villages that in many cases people don't join until they, after they need the services, but it does have a benefit. But the other issue is the fact that there are certain populations where there might be an economic disincentive to join a village, either they're younger or they don't have the money. Um, so we need to promote things, and in many cases the villages do, because there's no two villages that look alike, and some of them are all volunteer run. You have one in Kings Park, for example, that's going to be an all volunteer run village. But we need to recognize that that's a solution. It's a very established solution. It's one that's growing. We need to nurture it, but we need to nurture any model that we can come up with that promotes people caring about people. And not only creating livable communities for older adults, but livable communities for all people. And I think if you serve older adults, you indirectly serve all people. And that is, you know, we were talking before the show about group homes in our communities, and Donna, you can talk a little bit about that, that that is, you know, community is supposed to be made up of everyone. And, we, and it's, it's, it's unfortunate that we have to sort of 
reteach that lesson a yeah. little bit. Uh, yeah, often we're met with some resistance because uh, people don't don't know what they don't know, and so fear usually drives some some of the uh, discourse, unfortunately. But group homes are uh, a real answer for many of our friends who are ready to move out of their family homes. Um, we are just starting to, to crest that hill at Spark with uh, the age of, of our young adults because we're about 22 to about 40 is kind of the span of the ages that we currently are, are supporting. And so there are different transition points in life. And as you're, <coughs> as you're looking to move into your neighborhood and to be in independent, it's not just the bricks and mortar. It's about the support services that are going to go around that group home and how is a family going to have what we call pass the drop dead test and how is my young adult child going to continue the lifestyle that we have always been able to give her when I'm no longer here. So um, big, big decisions that have, to, that have to happen. But I do want to add that there are some very creative solutions, much like the village model going on conversations in the disabilities community around microboards. And so while we, we may have some people who um, don't have uh, family who are living long enough to take care of, of, of these people into their old age, Bringing in friends, neighbors, old teachers, you know, anybody that, you know, somebody from church, a variety, a diverse group of people who can help guide and, and, and you know, advise as a, a person with a disability ages, because that is the next challenge that I think Spark is going to have to face is what are we going to do with our friends as they become 55 and 60 years old and what what services look like in the community for people who are you know aging with disabilities already you know, not it, acquiring them it's interesting rich you know you you mentioned that when our when our neighborhoods were built 50 years ago they, they were they were very homogeneous everybody w was the same everybody was white middle class in their 30s and every morning uh, Dad got in the car, drove out to Braddock Road, turned either left <laughs> or right, depending which direction, to go downtown to work for the government. Mom stayed home with the kids, went to the swimming pool, and everybody did the same thing. And um, that's where, you know, suburbs got this, you know, sort of reputation as being sterile a bit. And, uh, you know, and now what <coughs> we're seeing is, and, and there's two sides of every coin, as we become very diverse, um, I think there's a good side in that the fact that okay we have an aging population that's growing we have a, a lot of kids and young people moving in we've got people all over not only the ethnic and racial you know, dynamics but economically age-wise ability-wise makes it a more interesting place almost definitely <laughs> it does absolutely yeah, there's no question about absolutely. that and, and so we just but it's a little more complicated and that's the, the the philosophical jump is to say to people you know you really if you think about it you don't want everyone in your neighborhood to look just like you and be just like you. That's no fun. I mean, no. It's, that's, and that's not what a no, community no. is. And, you know, I, I think some of the, the other interesting parts uh, that I'm seeing are because of um, job, you know, lack of jobs and the expense of living, particularly in our area, we're seeing a lot more intergenerational homes. Right. And as you look at, you know, just the families that I support, well, you know, if you have a 35-year-old child living with you and you're taking care of an elderly parent and you yourself are 60 years old, um, you have a college graduate who comes back, you know, home to live as well because it's not easy to go out and find your own apartment and your own job right <coughs> out of college. So we're seeing a lot, the neighborhoods are looking a lot different. And I think that's the good news for people with disabilities because I think that we are having a different complexion in each and every um, pocket of Fairfax County. And so I hope to see with the closing of the training centers and with people being integrated into our community that we're going to be a little bit more more accessible and inclusive um, to right. friends with disabilities. And Richard gives us opportunities for people to volunteer, and that's a big part of the 50 plus plan and a lot of the work that you've been doing. Right, and it is it is essential that people understand that this does not happen without the involvement of a lot of people. There's a program in Fairfax County called Volunteer Solutions, um, where people can volunteer for various and sundry county related services, many of which are means tested. There are programs in, in, in faith based communities, there are programs like Donna has. There are programs, I mean, you know, it's, there, there's any, right. if you want to volunteer, right. there should be no problem right. following, finding a place. Uh, right. Just as an example, the ministry that Mary and I coordinate um, for transportation, we've got 20 drivers. These are retired people. Some of them are actually in their 80s. And they, <coughs> they only have to drive once or twice a month. But at the same time, it gives them a sense of involvement, purpose. And, and many of these people do many things. But it's really necessary, I think, for your own personal mental health uh, I cannot imagine, I don't play golf, I don't like golf, but I probably, <laughs> it's anathema to probably most of the people watching. But the fact of the matter is I cannot imagine 
not volunteering. I can't imagine using the skills God gave me, you know, not to continue to use them to serve people. That's just the way I am, and I think Donna probably feels the same well, way. Well, you've stumbled onto the, se the great secret, right, is that when people volunteer, they find out that they're doing as much, if not yes. more, for themselves than <laughs> yes. others. Yes. I derive much more satisfaction than I even believed I would. There's a burden of time, but at the same time, there's a satisfaction of feeling that you're using skills you have to serve people, even if it's in really minute ways. I mean, it, this doesn't have to be, you know, change the world, change the county. It can be very simple things like getting a guy to a chest x-ray, which we had to do tomorrow when he called today. So, I mean, it's, that makes you feel like you're doing something for, for people. I don't know, Donna, you probably feel And, that, and that's, you know, and, and, and that's going to be our final thought here because it's, it's just a great way to end the show on saying that if people can get out there and volunteer and help yes. each other, not only is your neighbor help, but you're helped yourself. We're out of time. I want to thank Donna and Rich for joining me today and congratulate them on being named Braddock's Lord and Lady Fairfax for 2015. It is indeed an honor to be chosen, and I appreciate all that they both have given back to the community. I hope you've enjoyed this segment of Braddock Neighborhood News. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions, comments, or other needs, please contact my office at 703-425-9300 or email braddock at fairfaxcounty.gov. Tune in next month for another edition, and please remember to look for ways to volunteer. Your community needs you.